Chapter 1. Dog. Charlie is halfway across the dam, sweat dripping down her back under her t-shirt when her father drives past her on his way back to work. She doesn't look at him. As slowly as he is driving, the car still kicks up gray white dust from the gravel road. She walks through the dust, as straight and tall as she can make herself, jamming her walking stick into the stones as she goes, trying not to limp. She's walking. It is what he wants, and she's doing it. But if he's so interested in the best thing for her, why can't he let her decide what that is? I won't have you sitting in that chair all summer, he yelled when she refused to come sit with him and eat the lunch Sarita had to scramble to fix when he showed up suddenly, unexpectedly, in the middle of the work day. Summer hasn't even started yet, she yelled back. It's the last day of school for kids who are in school, he said. You'd think it was her fault that she isn't in school, finishing the sixth grade with everybody else. You only have ten weeks to build up your strength and be ready when school starts again. You are to get outside today. It's time, Charlene. Your physical therapist says you're healing well and a little exercise is all you need to get back to normal. You will start by walking. Today. Is that clear? He was using his I am the boss voice that keeps a factory full of workers in line. She lowered the footrest of the recliner chair, picked up her walking stick from the floor, and got to her feet as gracefully as she could. Without a word, she went down the hall to her room and put on her sneakers. Then, pounding the stick on the floor as she went, she walked straight through the living room and the dining room, out the sliding glass door, and down the ramp he had had built over the stairs her second week in the hospital. Her father was at the breakfast table in the lake room when she left, waving his fork in the air as he talked into his cell phone. He might have taken time to come home for lunch, but he hadn't really left his work, Charlie thinks, as his car moves up the hill on the other side of the dam and disappears around the curve. It's what her father does. Work. Normal for him means his 80-hour work week. By the time the dust from his car settles, Charlie has reached the end of the dam, where there is a bench under a willow tree by the water. She could sit there in the shade a while, looking at Eagle Creek, its ripples glittering in the sun. She could rest her leg and then go home again. But she keeps walking, up the slope of the road. She can walk all right. She's done with the wheelchair, done with crutches. The miracle of the rod the doctor stuck in her bone and her right leg from her hip to her knee means she has never had to wear a cast. By now, all there is to show for what happened to her is the scar down her leg where they put the rod in and the walking stick she made so she wouldn't have to use that stupid old lady-looking cane Tony, her physical terrorist, tried to give her after the crutches. Her father wants her back to normal. Normal? What is that? Is that what her life was the first week in March, before her friend Amy's brother Travis gave them a ride to home from school that rainy Monday afternoon? Before he got to showing off and playing NASCAR driver? Before what the papers called a one-car accident that was really one car and one tree? She can't remember the accident that put her in the hospital and ended the school year for her. She can't even remember the first few days after it. The doctors say, because of the concussion, she probably never will. If there is one thing she's learned for sure in her 12 years of life, it is that you can't go back to the way things used to be. No matter how much you want to, you can't go back. Somehow or other, you have to keep going forward. It's just that she hasn't figured out yet how to do that. Whether she spends a whole summer in the recliner chair or out here walking the hot, dusty road around Eagle Lake, it can't be like the last two summers. This summer can't be Charlie and Amy at Amy's house, swimming in Amy's pool, playing tennis, going to movies, hanging out at the mall, spending whole days at a time at Carowinds Amusement Park with Amy's family. Because this summer, Travis is working to pay his father back for the car he wrecked. And Amy... Amy... Charlie stabs her walking stick into the gravel and a little puff of dust rises into the air. She has reached the split where the gravel road that is Eagle Lake Drive goes straight ahead, past the caretaker's house and out to the pa paved country road, and also right through the woods toward the south side of the lake. She turns right and keeps walking, where the road splits again, right to the four houses closest to the dam and left to the rest of the houses on the other s south side of the lake. She goes left. Trees nearly meet over her head, thick woods on one side, woods with houses on the other. She goes on stabbing her walking stick into the gravel, goes on making the little puffs of dust. Amy, her best friend since second grade, is going off to spend the whole summer at Lake George in upstate New York with Becky Sue Lindner. Charlie still can't quite believe it. If it was Amy who had been smashed up in a car accident, if it was Charlie whose brother caused that accident, and if Amy was supposed to be getting out and starting to do stuff to get her strength back, 
Charlie would be right there doing stuff with her. That's what best friends are for. Evelyn Lindner was a tennis champion, you know, Amy's mother explained when she called a couple weeks ago to break the news. As it was her mother instead of Amy, as if it was her mother instead of Amy who had made the decision. She coaches Becky Sue, and she's offered to coach Amy, too. It's a chance of a lifetime. Amy's mother didn't say that Charlie wouldn't be up to playing tennis with Amy this summer. She didn't have to. Amy called then to say it was all her mother's idea, and she didn't want to go. But Charlie knows better. She's seen Amy get what she wants plenty of times before. As soon as Amy's mother said goodbye, Charlie hung up, opened her laptop, and deleted every single photo of the two of them together. And she quit responding to Amy's instant messages. Whenever Amy called after that, Charlie told Sarita she didn't want to talk. She won't have to think about calls or emails or instant messages from Amy much longer now. The Lindners don't let their kids have computers at Lake George. Today, June 10th, is the last day of school, and tomorrow Amy and Becky Sue's family will leave first thing in the morning. They won't be back until the weekend before school starts again. A hawk screams overhead. Charlie stops in the middle of the road and looks up, catching sight of it for only a few seconds before it circles out of sight behind the trees. What does a hawk have to scream about, she thinks. It's up there, riding the air, high and easy, not even moving its wings. She wipes the sweat from her eyes with her free hand and curses. Her other hand is practically paralyzed from holding onto her walking stick so hard. She understands now why canes are made the way they are, so you can put your weight on the handle. All those hours she spent whittling the bark off her stick and smoothing it, carving her initials into it, and she'd be better off with the cane Tony wanted to give her. Now that she'd stopped, Charlie is suddenly aware of how much her bad leg hurts. Even her so-called good leg aches from the walking. Her jaw hurts, too. She must have been clenching her teeth against the pain, she thinks. What she wants right this minute is to be back home, back in the recliner chair with something cold to drink, right now. The trouble is she's walked so far that she's almost directly across the lake from her house. Getting home means either turning around and going back the way she came, or walking the woods trail around the shallow end of the lake where there are no houses. The woods trail is shorter, but she doesn't walk the woods trail, not ever. The woods trail is part of the reason she hates living at Eagle Lake. It's part of the way things used to be, when things really were normal, before the accident and before... Charlie stops herself. The woods trail is part of what she will never have back again. Besides, it's tough going. Winding steeply up and down, skirting the ridge above the water, her leg hurts way too much to go that way, even if she wanted to. She stands in the sticky North Carolina June afternoon, wishing she could fly like that hawk. She will have to turn back and go the long way. At least there's the bench by the dam where she can rest. She will not do this walk again any time soon, that she knows for sure. She pulls her soggy t-shirt away from her skin, wipes the sweat off her face again, and turns to start back. That is when she sees the dog. It is sitting tall and rock still on a smooth patch of bare red dirt at the base of a big sweet gum tree in the woods, barely visible between the scrubby brushes and the tangle of honeysuckle vine that edged the, the road. It is red gold, almost the color of the ground it's sitting on. It's head high, its dark ears prickled sharp in her direction. The dog's eyes, dark in a narrow golden face, are looking directly at her. She feels a kind of tremor, as if an electric shock has passed from the dog to her and back again. She knows all the Eagle Lake dogs. This isn't one of them. For that matter, it doesn't really look like a dog. Not like someone's pet. There's a wildness about it, like a wolf or a coyote. It's beautiful. It has a coyote's pointed ears, a black muzzle, and those electrifying eyes. For just a moment, there's nothing in all the world except Charlie and the dog. She remembers then a dog she saw in the winter, February maybe, scrounging around the dumpster up past Eagle Lake stone gates near the power lines. That dog was about the same size as this one, a dirty reddish color. That dog wasn't beautiful. It had looked wild, though, wild and wary. Its shoulders hunched, its ears back, its tail down as it scuttled off into the woods. Surely this can't be that dog. It couldn't have lived on its own in the woods all these months. She blinks. The dog has vanished. The patch of bare ground where it was sitting is empty now. She can't remember looking away, but she must have, because the dog's gone, like a ghost, just gone. Chapter 2. Promise She's standing there, trying to figure out where the dog is, how it could have gone without a sound, without her seeing it go, when she hears a car coming up the slope of the road behind her. That probably explains the dog's leaving, she thinks. 
Its sharp ears must have heard the crunch of tires on gravel long before she did. A black SUV appears over the crest of the hill. It's Mrs. Davis with her kids, Jeremy and Beth Ann, and Sadie, their golden retriever. The car comes on past their drive and stops beside her. Mrs. Davis puts down her window. Hey, Charlie, you're looking great. A little hot, but great. This is your first time around the lake? Charlie nods. Good for you. The back window goes down and Beth Ann puts her head out. Are you all done with your crutches? All done, Charlie says to Mrs. Davis. Have you all seen a wild dog hanging around? You mean Wolfie, Beth Ann asks? Mrs. Davis laughs. Have we seen him? He's Sadie's best friend. Follows her everywhere she goes. He showed up about a month ago, and he's been hanging around ever since. That dog's a real sweetie, if you ask me, except he's terrified of people. Something really bad must have happened to him. In spite of the heat, Charlie feels goosebumps rise on her arms. Something really bad. How does he eat, she asks. Doesn't much, as far as I know. He's thin as a rail. He's practically starving, but Mommy won't let us feed him, Beth Ann says. Mrs. Davis shrugs. You feed a dog and you're stuck with it. Sadie's more than enough dog for us. Somebody around here must be giving him something, though. I can't believe he's living entirely on mice and voles. He could catch squirrels, Jeremy says, sticking his blonde head out the window next to Beth Ann. There's bazillions of squirrels. Too many trees, Mrs. Davis tells him. It's too easy for them to get away. She turns back to Charlie. I called animal control. Thought maybe if they took him, somebody might adopt him. They couldn't catch him. That dog's too wily. They baited the trap with a can of tuna. Told us tuna'd catch any dog. Not that one. They said they'd come back when they could gather up enough volunteers to surround him. But it's been weeks and I haven't heard anything. Charlie thinks about a dog too wily to be caught like other dogs. A starving dog that something really bad happened to. She imagines the golden dog with the wild eyes surrounded by people closing in to catch him and put him in a cage. It makes her feel sick to her stomach. Maybe I could get him to come live with us. As soon as the words are out of her mouth, she wants to take them back. She's never had a dog. She knows nothing about dogs. Mrs. Davis grins. That would be super. We've been worried to death about him. Can't nobody get close to him, Jeremy says. We've been trying. How are you all going to be able to get him over to the other side of the lake? Charlie doesn't have an answer. It isn't as if she's thought this out. Well, good luck to you, Mrs. Davis says, and begins to back the car down the road. Anything we can do to help, just let us know. Charlie stands there feeling like an idiot. She doesn't want a dog. Not any dog, let alone a wild and terrified one. Except there was that moment when she first saw him. Maybe it was the way he was sitting, so straight and tall, so incredibly alert. Right then, he didn't look scared or starving. He looked wild, magical, part of the woods. When Jeremy and Beth Ann get out of the car in their driveway, Sadie leaps out between them and tears down the road toward Charlie. She jumps up and puts her both paws on Charlie's chest so that Charlie has to hang on to her walking stick to keep from being knocked over. Sadie's tongue slathers Charlie's face. Down, Sadie, Mrs. Davis yells. Get down! Charlie's in no shape to have dogs jumping on her. It's okay, Charlie pushes Sadie down and wipes her cheek on the shoulder of her t-shirt. The wild dog is suddenly there, as if he's materialized out of the woods. Like a ghost, Charlie thinks again. Sadie runs to greet him. Tails wagging, they touch noses and then jump at each other. The wild dog is very nearly the same color as Sadie, except for his black muzzle and ears, and very nearly the same size. Charlie can see his ribs through his fur, and his tail is matted. If it were comb, Charlie thinks, it would be every bit as thick and plumy as Sadie's. Sadie begins chasing him around the hydrangea bush in Davis's yard. The wild dog swerves and cuts behind a tree, leaping out as Sadie runs past, grabbing her by the scruff of the neck. Bigger and heavier, Sadie knocks him sideways and breaks his grip and then grabs him by one ear. I told you they were best friends, Mrs. Davis says, pulling a bag of groceries out of the back end of her car. Come help, kids. Charlie thinks about what Mrs. Davis said about the wild dog following Sadie. Do you think if Sadie came round the lake with me, he would follow us? I wouldn't be surprised. He follows when Don takes Sadie running. He doesn't like the road, though. It's too wide, too exposed, I think. He likes to stay under cover in the woods. Not the road. If she tries this, walking Sadie to get the wild dog to follow, she'll have to take the woods trail. No, she won't do that. But the dog is starving. Again, her mouth seems to work without her permission, as if somebody else is using it. Would it be okay, then, if I walk Sadie over to my house? If the dog follows, I could feed him something. 
Good idea, Mrs. Davis reaches into her grocery bag and pulls down a can of dog food. She gives it to Jeremy to take to Charlie. Give him that. Thanks. Charlie puts the can of dog food into the pocket of her cargo shorts. Good luck, Mrs. Davis starts for the house. When we want Sadie home, she called over her shoulder. We'll just holler for her. She can swim back. Can I go along with Charlie, Beth Ann asks. You may not. That dog doesn't need any extra people to contend with. Bring the milk. When Mrs. Davis and the children go into the house, Charlie calls to Sadie. You want to go for a walk? Before she has a chance to fend the dog off with her walking stick, there are new red-orange paw prints on the front of her shirt. Charlie looks for the wild dog and sees that he's back in the woods across the road. I'm not making any promises, she tells the dog, except this one. If you come around the lake with Sadie and me now, I'll give you some food. That's all. A slant of sunlight through the trees catches the gold of his fur and he twitches his ears, but he doesn't move. Let's go, Charlie calls to Sadie. Let's walk. Sadie barks and runs ahead toward where the road ends at the Kudzu-covered slope down to the power lines right away. Charlie uses the bottom of her t-shirt to wipe the sweat from her face and starts limping after her. As if she understands the plan, Sadie, tur Sadie turns onto the narrow trail that winds down the steep hill next to the last house on the south side of the lake. Crazy Sherman's log cabin, with its odd collection of sculptures made from bits of rusted junk. Limping, Charlie follows. At first, she's glad to get off the road, where walking on the gravel keeps twisting her ankle and knee, sending jolts of pain through her leg. But the trail, narrow and uneven underfoot, isn't much better. It's crisscrossed with kudzo vines, like an obstacle course of trip wires. Halfway down, she turns to see if the wild dog is following, and her foot catches on a vine. She has to grab for a sapling and then stab her stick into the dirt to keep from falling down the hill. As she pulls herself upright, she catches a glimpse of the wild dog slipping in between the trees up near the road. He is following.